standards. So let's watch this video, The Absurdity of Socialism. It's absurd. Absurd, as I was saying earlier, is one of the things that I like to say about the capitalists. Right? This system is so absurd and the people who have to lie in favor of this system, the bourgeois propagandists and the imperialist ideologues, just find themselves in the most absurd positions because they're trying to defend uh, a system that's based on irreconcilable contradictions, the contradiction between capital and labor. Um, so it brings them to these absurd positions in trying to defend that system and prop it up as the best system possible. But I guess Jordan Peterson and Dave Rubin think the opposite. They think socialism's absurd, which we shouldn't be surprised that absurd people would look at socialism and think that it's absurd. But I want to hear their arguments. I want to hear what they have to say. Maybe they'll change my mind. Maybe I won't be a socialist or a Marxist anymore, and I'll embrace Jordan Peterson, Dave Rubinism. Let's check it out. The point that for a very long time, we understood how dangerous that sort of drift towards totalitarianism is. It seems to have washed out of the system now. Mm -hmm. It seems as though we don't teach history, we don't respect it, we don't understand that it can teach us valuable lessons. What worries me about that is the old saying, uh, if you don't understand history, you may very well repeat it. Already, historical analysis based on CIA theory based on Hannah Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism, brought to you by the CIA and the Congress for Cultural Freedom as a way to say that the communist Soviet Union who defeated the Nazis are the same as the Nazis, are just as bad, are just as authoritarian, and we should be just as scared of communism as we are of fascism, even though the liberals facilitated the rise of Hitler and capitalism and finance capital, including George Bush's grandpa, facilitated the rise of Hitler who was then defeated by the communists, by the Soviet Union, who took 80% of the casualties in that war and industrialized themselves quickly using socialist central economic planning to defeat the Germans. The, those are the same thing, same exact thing. Anybody who says totalitarianism when beginning their argument is literally just going to conflate communism and fascism as being equally bad. And it's literally stemming from the CIA. This is the intention they had when they funded Hannah Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism. Why do we walk away from people we can trust warning us of the consequences? Well, of I think there's an interesting history. reason for that that sort of brings the Solzhenitsyn story into 2019, which is that he was truly oppressed. This was a life of actual oppression, right? Now we have people that are walking around. Everyone in this room has this in their pocket. And if you have this in your pocket Tur and you Turned think, off, I hope. Yeah, hopefully turned off. But if you have this thing in your pocket and you think you're oppressed, you're, you're very confused. We uh, you want to talk about being very confused? Oh my gosh, Dave Rubin is such a silly little man. This is the, my favorite Dave Rubin argument of all time. If you have a cell phone in your pocket, you can't be oppressed, right? If we were to go back to the American South during the time of slavery and you gave each of those slaves an iPhone, that would mean that they're no longer oppressed. Yes, they might be whipped if they don't pick enough cotton per hour to make a huge, huge surplus for the plantation owner whipping them but if you have an iphone you can go on twitter you can snapchat yourself being enslaved so you can't be oppressed if you have snapchat and twitter on your cell phone like what is what is this you're trying to say that exploitation doesn't exist the accumulation of capital doesn't exist starvation and imperialism and all these products of capitalism don't exist or they aren't products of capitalism because capitalism also has cell phones. Because capitalism also sells you a $400 iPhone that's created by, like we were saying earlier in the stream, a lot of really hard labor in Africa to mine cobalt, including child labor, a huge amount of child labor, which creates or is used to mine cobalt, which is 
the main property in your cell phone screen. But because of that, there's no oppression. And anybody who thinks they're oppressed is confused. Socialism is when no iPhone. Yep. I guess that meme came from Dave Rubin himself. I shouldn't be surprised. Christian, uh, Christian Elan Ortiz says, but so true that we can't just be anti-war. We must be anti-imperialist as well. Absolutely. This is such a great point, a more serious point than the hilarious iPhone point that Dave Rubin made. But imperialism is an economic system. Imperialism relies on exploitation and the export of capital to the imperialized nations to extract resources and, and cheap labor. Right. So you can't be against imperialism by just being against the war or the wars, the war in Libya or the war in Syria. Right. You have to not only be against those wars in Africa and the bombing of Somalia and all the other interventions in Africa and U.S. Africa Command, AFRICOM and the drone warfare. You can't just be against that stuff, but you have to be against the exploitation, too. You have to be against the cobalt mines that use child labor to help Apple make a bunch of money selling iPhones. Right? You have to be against the economic exploitation. You have to be against all of Bill Gates's um, agricultural companies and fertilizer companies that have made millions of dollars off Africa and poisoned their soil to the point where they had a summit basically begging Bill Gates to leave them alone. Right? Without being against that economic exploitation, you can't be against the wars because the wars are a way of furthering and continuing that economic exploitation continuing the economic subservience of African or Latin American or South Asian countries to the to Wall Street and the giant banks that they're merged with. So you can't be against imperialism truly without being against capitalism, right? Because that is the root. Capital is the root of imperialism. You can ally with libertarians and stuff for anti-war rallies, but then at that anti-war rally, you have to explain to as many people as you can that capital and the capitalist relations of production at the core of our system are the real drivers of war. We, we live in a time with such absurd freedoms in the West that are so uh, beyond imagination of what people could only dream of two generations ago, even one generation ago, especially with this, that people now are, have a perceived oppression instead of a real oppression. So one of the things that I find when I go to uh, when I go to college campuses, is that you know these kids will protest and they'll scream and that you know that everyone's all right and everyone's a neo-Nazi and the rest of this, and I I always find all right well how do you how do you break through to somebody like that how do you actually when they have you know you've talked about this when they have that look in their eye truly a possessed look and and they're you know it's this this postmodern monster has become sort of a secular religion, uh, and I think that's also one of the reasons why what Jordan's doing is resonating because. They've they've removed religion from the equation and now they have no meaning and they put it all into this really competing set of ideas. Zest look and, and they're you know, it's this this postmodern monster has become sort of a secular religion. Uh, and I think that's also one of the reasons why what Jordan's doing is resonating because they've they. I think that might be the most intelligent thing Dave Rubin's ever said. He said it by accident because he thinks postmodernism is the same thing as Marxism and just leftism in general. But that's how how Professor Hans Moller, this really good philosopher out of China, describes wokeism, right? Wokeism meaning liberalism, uh, supposedly fighting for racial liberation, religious liberation, um, all these different kinds of liberation except class, ABC, anything but class. Right. Um, like the CIA commercial talking about how woke they are. That's wokeism. And he says that in America, it's basically a civil religion. It's a form of civil religion. Right. We've moved towards being more secular and away from organized religion in the traditional sense. Um, so a lot of people can throw themselves into wokeism, these social justice movements, which ultimately just filter into the Democratic Party and maintain the status quo. But it gives them purpose. It gives them community. It acts as an opium of the masses the same way that religion acted as an opium of the masses. You know, that's one of the more nefarious and less seen effects of wokeism, meaning identity politics being focused on uh, and prioritized above class politics. Um, that's one of the effects that it's had. Um, and then you have these folks like Jordan Peterson and Dave Rubin come along, though, 
who are the mirrors of wokeism. And this is also a concept from Professor Hans George Muller, who came up with the wokeism as a civil religion idea. Right? He says that you have these folks like Peterson and Dave Rubin who come along then and they say, look at this postmodern neo-Marxism. That's how they define this postmodernism and identity politics obsession. And they say, I'm against that. You know, therefore, follow me. Therefore, I've got it all figured out. And also they conflate that postmodernism with Marxism. So they further confuse people. They further distract people. And they further bring people away from seeing the actual problem that is capitalism in our society and just moving them closer to individualism, you know, clean your room, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you'll be fine. Uh, but they're bringing in this whole audience by being against wokeism, by being against postmodernism, which is a product of capitalism and is a pro-capitalist ideology. Right. So you not only do you have the wokes, but you have the anti-wokes and they play off of each other and they distract from class. And that's exactly what Hans George Muller said. And it's playing out in real time here. And if some of you, I know I brought these up before, but this is the video I'm talking about. This guy isn't necessarily a Marxist. He doesn't call himself a Marxist. Very similar though. Uh, he made this video called, we'll pull it all the way up, Wokeism, where he talks about woke ideology, what it is. Um, here's me talking about him. And then he made one called The Mirror of Wokeism about Jordan Peterson. And then Jordan Peterson replied to him. So he made a response then. Um, I also use this concept to criticize um, Ryan Chapman, one of his viral videos. Used it to criticize or I reacted to another one of his videos. Um, so, yeah, if you want, the other one is just On George Muller, Mirror of Wokeism. There you see George Man. Peterson being a mirror of wokeism. So recommend everyone check that out. I recommend all Marxists check that out. Um, he makes the point that he's in favor of class-based liberation. He's in favor of the liberation of the economic toiling masses like Marxism promotes. Um, but he thinks that identity politics are being used to distract from class politics. So he's not just an anti-woke person. I'm um, talking about how the liberals are everything wrong with society. They removed religion from the equation and now they have no meaning and they put it all into this really competing set of ideas, uh, what, what we call the, the oppression Olympics, where they're constantly competing for oppression because they believe that victimhood is virtue and victimhood, of course, is not virtue. What's virtuous is getting your life in order and going out and doing something. So I'm always looking for a little trick to, to get through to these kids. And it's really hard because when they have that sort of glossed over zombie look, it's, it's tough. And I found one trick that actually kind of works. If you can get it to them in, in the most simple. I'm so interested to hear what his trick is to break kids out of wokeism and bring them towards Dave Rubinism, cell phoneism. Um, but this is such an interesting comment. I have to make a quick response to this comment. It pull runs rampant on TikTok and Twitter. Makes me think if Tumblr was a psyop to see how well it would work on social media. Literally, I've had that same thought. So I read the I had to read the book Kill All Normies by Angela Merkel. Is that who it is? Who's been blackballed from academia for writing that and smeared as a bigot um, for writing that? Not Angela Merkel. That's the freaking leader of Germany. Um, Angela Nagel. Yeah, Kill All Normies, which was basically about these politics, these like hyper identity politics that was growing on Tumblr. And she detailed how they're, you know, there's this gender ideology on Tumblr that believes, you know, nobody is cisgender. There's, a, you know, they have a list of 60 some different genders that you can be. Um, and some of them have to do with like your gender changes with the phases of the moon, you know, getting into the point of some like really kind of silly stuff, um, which I always thought that was just Tumblr, right? I always I followed that stuff and thought it was kind of crazy, but I always thought it would just be contained to Tumblr. And it's like that sort of Tumblr exclusive ideology that used to sort of be mocked and led to the whole Gamergate situation. Not, I mean, that and other factors, but um, is now like promoted by CNN and MSNBC. And it's on TikTok and it's on Twitter and the mainstream social media. And it's being taught in the academy and right? it's being taught in colleges. Uh, 
<laughs> and, you know, not that I'm in favor of progressive, you know, social liberation movements. Absolutely. I consider myself a feminist and all that. Uh, but, you know, some of it definitely gets a little bit ridiculous. And that used to be like Tumblr. But now, you know, that's like the mainstream leftist position or a lot of these crazy Tumblr positions. So it's almost like they did a psyop. And just, you know, saw how well this would work on Tumblr and then try to take it uh, on a macro scale. Um, I've thought that forever. Christopher Romero just put words to something that I've always thought. Personal way. And this particularly works in the United States, and I have no doubt that it would work here in Australia as well. I'll say to them, anyone in this room, does anyone in this room have it worse than their grandparents? Now, I've done this, I don't know, 100 times probably. Nobody has ever raised their hand. Nobody ever. If you live in the United States, you basically short. I mean, the only outsider case would be if your grandparents were oil barons or something like that. And then they lost all the money, in which case, in which case the leftists would actually love that too because it would show that, well, it would show that that accumulated wealth doesn't stay beyond generations. So they're all about that, right? So, but if you can do something like that, I mean, if you say, I mean, everyone in this room can do it. Like, can what are these freaking 1920s Republican talking points he's using? Accumulated wealth doesn't stay in the generations. Yeah, okay. I'm sure George Bush and Jeb Bush and George H.W. Bush didn't get any of their wealth from their dad, who was a finance capitalist and weapons contractor who helped hit or got rich via Hitler's rise to power in Germany. I'm sure he didn't pass down any of that accumulated wealth to them. That has nothing to do with you know, why they're in positions of power now or the Koch brothers whose grandfather was an oil baron, right? They got to be oil barons themselves via hard work. They didn't inherit those companies. Like what the hell are you talking about, dog? Everyone picture their grandparents. Do you have it better or worse? I mean, does anyone in here have it worse than their grandparents? And that shows you that it's a perceived oppression, not a real oppression, that, that the thing that they're fighting, this, patriarchal, postmodern, capitalistic thing that they're fighting. I mean, they can't define it, so it's hard to define it for them. Uh, that it actually has bent toward justice. All so there's how they replace postmodernism with Marxism, right? These guys are fighting against this weird postmodernist capitalist feeling, right? They're fighting against the feeling of alienation. I mean, that kind of is postmodernism. Right. They'll say we're against capitalism, but every struggle against capitalism throughout human history has failed miserably. Soviet Union, China, Cuba, these are all just horrible failures that we should never repeat. But we're against capitalism. We're anti-capitalism. You know, that's postmodernism. It's pseudo Marxism. It's pseudo leftism. And Gabriel Rockhill has showed in all his wonderful scholarship how that ideology has been promoted by the ruling class and even directly promoted by the CIA. But what these anti wokist figures like Peterson and Dave Rubin do is they say that postmodern pseudo Marxism is actual Marxism. That's actual socialism. And, you know, this is what socialists support. Um, when socialists would be against uh, Western postmodernism and pseudo Marxism and offer an alternative to both that and Dave Rubin's theory, and socialists do have very, very clear ideas of what we're trying to get rid of or what we're trying to alleviate, the class contradictions at the core of our society. So it's not as vague and you know made up as an I idealist as the postmodernists, which is why he tries to associate us with postmodernists, which is why the CIA thought it'd be so useful to associate Marxism with pseudo Marxist postmodernists. Always. Always. And when, when you get, if you can plant that seed in them, I think it's a little bit of something. But it's very hard to break them out of that. But I think the key here is understanding that it's a perceived oppression. If you live in a free society in the West in 2019, you're not oppressed. You, you, maybe, you maybe don't have it as well as your neighbor does. And maybe you came from more and they came from less. Or maybe you're sick and they're not. Or a series of other things. Um, but you've got a chance. And that's all you're supposed to have in life. And I think getting that through to them, as opposed to, oh, the system is horrible and I have to now destroy the system as if they could magically reconstitute a system that really would just be in effect throwing away thousands of years of human history, that they're so. No, socialism is the culmination of thousands of years of historical development. And it would happen as a process of construction over time that would take the capitalist system we currently have 
and build it into a system that's better. And in fact, capitalism and its development creates the possibility for socialism and advances the means of production um, and it advances their technological capacity and concentrates them so they can be seized by the workers and utilized by the workers um, in a system that's new and better. Same way feudalism and slavery gave way for a new and better system of capitalism to come about. Right? This is Marxism. This is the actual idea. What he's doing as what all these people do is straw manning that and saying that Marxists are utopians, Marxists are idealists, Marxists are postmodernists. And then he knocks down that straw man idea and says, you know, it's so hard to convince kids that we can't have anything better at all. And it's so hard to convince kids that they'll never have anything good in life, that humanity doesn't have the potential to actually build a system that takes care of people and meets their needs and allows humans to flourish. Get used to the current system, put your head down and start working till you die. He's like, I have such a hard time convincing kids of that ideology. Like, oh, I wonder why. Maybe because kids look around and see the horrible exploitation and warfare created by capitalism and starvation and homelessness. And they're like, this sucks. We can definitely do something better. And then, yeah, a lot of those kids are drawn into postmodernism by the CIA compatible left because they think capitalism is bad, but they've been told their whole lives that socialism always failed. So they move to these thinkers like Adorno and Horkheimer, who claim to be socialists, um, but are actually, you know, CIA plants, essentially, or are doing the bidding of the CIA for them and becoming intellectual superstars in the process um, that has created a sort of compatible left that draws kids. And then these anti-woke figures are tell these kids, no, 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 no. You know, you're believing in Marxism and postmodernism, which are the same thing. Come believe in unfettered neoliberal capitalism with us. Um, so you see how the, the anti or the pseudo Marxist compatible left works to draw those kids in. And then the anti wokists like Dave Rubin and Jordan Peterson confuse them further by equating Marxism with postmodernism, making it hard for kids to see their way out and see their way to, you know, orthodox Marxism or Marxism Leninism, which we believe is, you know, the way forward. Wise. They're so wise at 24 years old as they're shouting down speakers that they could they could build up what nobody before them could. And that, that's the danger there. So I think getting them to to think about their own lives, where they come from, I think is a pretty effective way of, of getting through to people. Well, we could also say, like, look, there's a claim that the West is an oppressive patriarchy. And so that's actually true. The, the problem with the claim is that it's not just an oppressive patriarchy. And there's a big difference between something being completely something and something being partly something. Because one of the things you might point out is that you can look at human history anywhere and what you see is a complete bloody nightmare, right? It's, it's, it's death and struggle and privation and war and horror everywhere with some progress, you know, some ability of us to pull ourselves out of the mire, you know, and the West is the same. Is There's plenty of catastrophe in our past and of all sorts. And, and I think he's about to say Western society is the best possible society ever, which I can't wait that really reveals his hypocrisy, the fact that he'll criticize and say all the socialist republics and say they've never achieved anything, but the Western societies have um, really shows the foolishness of Jordan Peterson's whole stick. But I wanted to say, address the argument Dave Rubin made that people have it better than their grandparents, you know, so therefore they shouldn't ever complain or say they're oppressed or try and change the system. When this person says, Seller Dorp says, uh, going back to the who has it worse off than their grandfathers. That's partially because of the fights of leftists and unionists throughout the years. OMG. Exactly. The reason that we have a lot of um, social programs, we don't have a lot, but the reason we have any social programs or our government feels any need to take care of us or things have gotten better in any way, it's been because of class struggle. It has been because of worker organizing and because of unions been because of struggles by the organized combined workers against the capitalist class. And additional, in addition to that, technology moves forward. Like, yes, technology always develops. 
Marx was very clear that capitalism um, develops the productive forces and their productive capacity. But even beyond that, technology is developed under every human system ever, right? Some systems impede the advancement of technology at a certain point or they slow it. They act as a fetter on production, as Marx would say. And then eventually the relations of production burst asunder. There's a revolution and the system is changed to um, allow for more technological advancement. Just as capitalism is acting as a fetter on production now and a move to socialism would advance technology in places like healthcare, um, in, in terms of science in general, space exploration, blah, blah, blah. Um, but no matter what, technology is always improving, right? Humans are always discovering new things. We're not getting dumber in terms of technology. So to say that, you know, time is linear and that things change over time and humans develop new things over time. And that means you can't complain about anything in modern day because there's more technology today than there was a hundred years ago. That's so freaking stupid because maybe the advancements in technology have made it so that the old system, capitalism, is no longer the best system. Maybe the advancements in technology mean that we can um, centrally plan an economy that will take care of everybody's needs, allow everybody to flourish, and advance um, our technological capacities and scientific understanding beyond what it's ever been before. Right? Maybe we can move to a new system that better harnesses the advancements in technology that you've realized. Right? But we'll never know this if we just say, no, 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 we can never even talk about a new system because we have iPhones now and my Mima didn't have an iPhone. Like, Actually, what the shit are you saying, Dave Rubin? It, there's no way this dude ever thinks about any of the stuff he actually says. Because if he did for a second, he'd be like, uh, like on the Joe Rogan experience, when he was like, you know, we don't need regulation on construction sites. We don't need OSHA. Because everybody has a cell phone, everybody has an iPhone, and they can record any violations. And Joe is like, my dad worked in construction. You're on crack. You are talking a bunch of nonsense right now because obviously construction outfits would cut corners if it's going to save them money. And not every worker would record it on their iPhone because they can get fired. So you need regulators. Regulators do a lot of stuff on construction sites. They're constantly making sure that construction firms don't cut corners, which can get people killed, lead buildings to collapse, lead pipes to break and make people's lives much, much worse. So it's like the, in the smallest little bit of pushback from Dave Rubin just caused him to implode and his brain broke. But these shows that he's on right now never provide pushback. They let literally let him just say, you know, you have an iPhone now. Can't complain. Can't complain. Even if you are literally live in a closet isolated from humanity where you get tortured every day as long as you have an iphone in that closet can't complain <laughs> and then unparalleled death how many people's fathers grandfathers owned houses versus how many people own houses today exactly i can't even believe when my grandma and grandpa and mom and dad tell me about their economic situation when they were my age and they're honest about it even my grandparents who watch fox news are like yeah back in our day you know college wasn't expensive if you had the grades, you could go. Now, it, you know, we could buy a house. My grandpa always told me how he collected coins every day when he was in high school, like pennies and nickels and stuff, and used that to, like, pay for, like, two months rent or something when he was married, my grandma. I'm like, what the hell? I mean, I, I collected coins forever. I counted them the other day. I have, like, 16 bucks. That's, like, two years worth. It's nice, but I'm not going to be able to buy a freaking or pay my rent with it. It's, it's necessary to know that, but then it's necessary to separate the wheat from the chaff. You know, one of the things I see with readers who are um, unsophisticated and intellectually arrogant is they'll read someone great. Maybe they'll read Nietzsche, for example, and they'll find the odd thing that Nietzsche said that grates against their current moral sensibilities, um, whether they do that in context or out. And then they'll throw away the whole book. It's like, you don't throw away the whole book. It was Nietzsche. You don't throw away the book. He's like one in a billion. You read it carefully and you think, well. It's so funny because that's what he does with Marxism. Marx is so much more complex and in-depth and reveals so much more about the world than Nietzsche ever did.
but he just reads the manifesto and, you know, cherry picks it and straw mans it to say it's stupid and absurd and make his argument and then throws out the three volumes of capital Marx's masterpiece and anything else Marx ever wrote. Oh, but he says it's the other people who do that with Nietzsche. You know, that's what you do with Marx, Jordan Peterson. You know, you've been bullshitting about Marx. And that's why you're saying this, that some people in their intellectual arrogance, just take a little bit of Nietzsche and think they've understood the whole thing. You know, that's what you did with Marx. And this is you projecting. Okay. No to that. But yes to this, and you do the same thing with Dostoevsky, and you do the same thing with Tolstoy, you do, you do the same thing with the great writers of the past that have been passed down to us. You, you read intelligently, you separate the wheat from the chaff, right? And you gain wisdom that way. Well, you do the same when you look at your own history. It's like, well, of course it's a bloody nightmare. What, what do you expect? It's like, what's your point? We're going, to, we're going to burn it down and, and then we're going to have something better as a country. You could say the same thing about socialist revolutions. You always say that people died and it was violent. Therefore, socialism hasn't achieved anything and it's always failed. Like, yeah, people died in the October Revolution in Russia. They were being run by a czarist monarchy who was sending people, to working people and peasants to constantly fight and die in these senseless wars for accumulation. And people were sick of it and they had a revolution. And yeah, it was violent and chaotic and people died. But they overthrew the monarchy and they founded a worker state and taught everyone to read. Right? So everybody's history is going to be imperfect. But oh, the capitalists, the Western societies, they're allowed to be imperfect. But not the socialist societies. Not the Soviet Union. Not China. Got you. Got you. Only the Western societies are allowed to make mistakes like, you know slavery in building all of their wealth on the backs of slaves who were tortured consequence well not so easily not so quickly maybe we read our history carefully and we think okay well what did we get right well what did we get right well the sovereignty of the individual that's pretty good the fact that you have right to property that's pretty good you can argue about the limits on that but you know you don't want someone just that guy's dad definitely owns a business. Hold on, go back to that guy. He was nodding so fervently. Jordan Peterson's like, private property, the protection of private property by the state is really good. This guy's like, mm. that's pretty good. You can argue about the limits on that, but you know, you don't want someone just taking your purse. You know, it's 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 helpful that there are things that you can earn and own. You know, the dignity of the individual. That's another one. Um the innocence before the law. God, that's that's a miracle that we ever came up with that idea. I, I can't believe that that idea exists because in most cultures it's like, well, you might be guilty. Okay, you're dead. Because, well, that's easier. You might be guilty. You know what? That's so funny that that's his view of other cultures. Other cultures are just authoritarian. They just kill people anytime you disagree with with who? With the rest of the society? I, I don't get it. How do they decide, you know, who's right and who's wrong and who gets killed? They don't have legal systems. They don't have justice systems and other cultures. Okay, Jordan, you kind of just sound like a Western chauvinist who hasn't studied other countries. I'm not going to lie to you. Why go through all the trouble? There's plenty of people where you came from. It's like the trouble of presuming your innocence. It's even innocent. It's even hard for you to do that for yourself. And 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 the idea that that each person has an intrinsic worth regardless of their, well, externalities, let's say. That's another idea that's a complete miracle. It's like, what are we, what are we gonna do? We're gonna throw all that away with the statement that we live in an oppressive patriarchy. And then we're gonna be left with nothing. And, and, and what, what good is that? Well, how about we look at our history and we take responsibility for it. We think, okay, well, here's some things that need to be fixed. There's plenty of them, right? There's plenty of them for each of us to fix. And we'll go fix them. And maybe then we can atone for the bloodiness of our history and for our so-called unearned privilege, you know, some of which all of us have. And, and that would be good. That would be part of the adventure of your life. Someone said he individualizes everything. I mean, absolutely. Individualism. I said this too. Individualism is the basis of the capitalist superstructure. 
it's the culture and the education system and the media and the entertainment that you get in a society based on private property, individual property, based on capitalist relations of production. They use individualism. They've individualized everything. Nothing can be a collective issue. There are no collective interests and there are no collective struggles. Everything is about the individual. Absolutely everything um, is individualized. And you hear him talking about uh, talking about privilege there. And, you know, how can we atone for our privilege? And that's just that's another um, piece of individualism or an, another ideology of individualism that sort of check your privilege discourse. It's like, yeah, we have a society, a capitalist society based on exploitation that's gained all its wealth through imperialism and was originally based on slavery and gained its wealth through slavery. Um, so what do we do about that collectively? That's the, the society we're all living in collectively. Well, we change it to a better society, right? We recognize the flaws of our past and we move towards a secular society, an anti-racist society based on socialism. Right? We change the relations of production because we recognize that while our history was troubled and while our history was bloody and brutal in many ways, right? all we have are the conditions of today, which you know are a product of that historical development. And all we can do is move forward and do better. Right? So let's analyze the system that we have, analyze the conditions that history has handed us, and, and try and do something better collectively. Right? But everything's individualized, so they just say, all you can do is check your privilege. Right. All you can do is realize how different you are from other people. And if you're white in this country, just acknowledge that you have privilege. It's all it's a total individual solution. Right. Let's not collectively move towards a better kind of society, a better form of society. Let's individually all just check our privilege. And then that's the kind of argument Jordan Peterson responds to. Like, of course, society is bad. You know, we should atone for the past, but there's no need to check our privilege or whatever. Um, when in reality, he should be saying, you know, this is an individualist way to look at things. But he accepts that. He accepts the premise of looking at everything um, on the basis of individualism, everything through an individualist framework. <clears throat> and then he knocks down these liberal arguments, these woke arguments, um, kind of knocks them down and pretends that he's destroyed leftism and Marxism in the process. And collectivism. Too, and that's that's a far more sensible and wise approach to the diagnosis of what's wrong with the West than well, it's an oppressive patriarchy and it should be overthrown or whatever that you know current uh, low resolution and resentful ideology happens to be, and and there's something to be said for a bit of humility as well. Mm -hmm. It's like really you really think that you're capable of making large-scale social transformations and getting it right do you you really think that you're 25 you're 30 you're 40 i don't care you know what makes you think you're smart enough to pull off something like that it's very very difficult very it's all based on gaslighting too and revolution is difficult but it's all based on you're just an idiot you're just a kid you're stupid if you think that the society you see around you, that the system you see around you is messed up and you want to enact social reform, you want to fight for justice, you want to fight for change. That's actually just because you're an idiot. You're too stupid to be smart like me um, and, and really understand Marxism, even though you've read 330,000 more pages of Marx than I have. I understand it better than you because you're 24 and you're an idiot. So quit trying to change things, quit trying to change the world, quit struggling collectively for the better and just just clean your room. Just shut up and clean your room and try and make money. Go along with the system. When in reality, nobody's saying, Jordan, nobody's saying, I know how to change the system myself or I can change the system myself because this one guy, Karl Marx, came up with a way to change the system and I understand it better than anybody else. Right? It's not an individualist thing. It's understanding what class, what economic class you are a part of and advocating for that economic class to be in power. Because if you're part of the working class, that's the majority of society whose labor creates all the wealth of society. Yet that wealth is accumulated, concentrated and hoarded in the hands of the capitalist class who doesn't work. So we want to wage a collective struggle against them and enact the things, realize the things that this country is supposed to be based upon. 
you know, freedom of speech, freedom of democracy, I mean, an actual democracy, an economic and political democracy, because the masses will then be in power. Um, the, the right to life and right to the pursuit of happiness. You don't have a right to life in this country. 40,000 people die every year because they don't have health insurance, right? We want to collectively struggle with our class to realize, fulfill what this, this country is supposed to be based on, which is a democracy, control uh, by and for the masses. We realize that a small cabal of Wall Street and banking executives and shareholders control the entire system, political and economic right now. So we want to collectively struggle and bring power back to the masses. It's not individualist. It's not me thinking that I'm smarter than anybody. It's me knowing that everybody in my class can collectively realize that it's in their own interest to change the system, that it's in their own interest to fight against their own exploitation and the class exploiting them. But these people like Peterson can't even think collectively. Like uh, Christian said earlier, it's their default to turn everything into an individualist framework. Very, very, very difficult to take a system that works not too badly and to do anything to it that doesn't make it worse, much less to radically reconstitute it and make it better. That's really hard. So, you know, if you're upset about your culture, well, maybe you could think of some small ways that are local that you could go out and improve it. Well, I think we're not upset about the culture. I mean, maybe, but we're upset that the culture is a product of capitalism, of relations of production. How many times have I brought up the base and superstructure graph? Culture and education and media are a product of the relations of production the material basis at the core of society. So of course he diverts that. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to be, if you want to help society, go fight cultural battles, right? Go fight individual battles in the culture, you know, go listen to the Joe Rogan experience where he talks to Ben Shapiro or where he talks to Steven Crowder, you know, and get on board with those guys. They're fighting culture war battles. That's all we can really do. No, we want to attack the relations of production, but you don't even know what that means because you never actually read Marx like you said you did because you're an intellectual fraud, fraud who accuses other people of being intellectual frauds. You lazy pro-capitalist bastard talking about how other people are intellectually arrogant and intellectually weak because they don't read an entire system of philosophy before they talk about it. When you ain't read diddly dink dick about Karl Marx and you talk like you're the greatest expert that the West has ever produced, the humankind has ever produced, you're so damn arrogant. You should start with yourself because, well, then you're only harming yourself. And you're Start with yourself. Individualism, individualism, individualism. Change yourself. Collective. Anything collective is bad not a bad person to practice on and then you could extend that to your family well at least you suffer for the consequences of your own experiments that way rather than having someone else do it and then maybe you can work on bringing a little more harmony into your family and maybe you can get a job and see if you're any good at that and then if you manage those three things halfways respectably well then you could dare to put a toehold out into the broader community and think so once you're perfect, right, once you as a perf uh, an individual are perfect and pure, then you can go out into the world and change it. Yeah, it's never going to happen, Jordan. That's never going to happen. Humans are inherently flawed. We inherently make mistakes. And that includes humans who led socialist revolutions that I support, like Che Guevara and Fidel Castro. Because guess what? Humans are imperfect. And our history is imperfect, which you recognize. Yet when it comes to socialist countries and socialist leaders, you expect them to be perfect. <clears throat> you must attain individual per perfection in a system that's always beating you down before you go try and change the system. Well, that means I'm never going to go try and change the system because I'll never be perfect. Ah, that's the whole point of his ideology, though. Don't do anything collectively. Just focus on individualism and give up ever changing the system for the better. And this comment's hilarious. They want donations. How about I donate someone's health care debt? It's negative money, but money nonetheless. True. There's more debt in circulation in the U.S. than there is money in circulation.
could give some of that debt to Jordan Peterson if he likes capitalism and Western civilization so much. Maybe I have an idea here that we could tentatively attempt that might make some small thing slightly better that we could measure carefully and assess. And that would be your contribution. And, and yeah, we could do that, Jordan, but we don't have a democracy. We don't have a democracy dipshit. We have capitalism. We're a gang of Wall Street investors, bankers, and pedophiles like Jeffrey Epstein and his buddies make all the decisions. And they run your life. And they control your activity, your labor, and the product of your labor. So even if you have a good idea, it doesn't do jack shit because nobody's going to listen to you. Nobody in power is going to listen to you because power is concentrated in the hands of a few people. That's why we want a revolution. That's why we want socialism. So we can get everybody's input and we can go about changing the problems ahead of us slowly and, you know, with real democratic input from everybody. But you can't do that under our current system, which is why we want to change it. No, that's not me thinking I'm benevolent, thinking I know better than everyone else. That's me thinking everyone else would know better than the gang of Wall Street shareholders, bankers and pedophiles currently running our country because I actually believe in democracy Unlike you and all these frauds who claim that Western civilization is the greatest, even though our current civilization isn't living up to the standards that Western civilization is supposed to be based on. So if you love Western civilization so much, why aren't you worried about all the, the principles Western civilization is based on being infringed upon by the capitalist dictatorship? And dumb, dumb.